thank you all for coming. Um, it, it's great to be here with you. Uh, I was asked just to, to present um, a little bit about uh, my research. So I thought I would uh, present um, sort of how I think about behavioral finance and some of my research um, for which I, I'm probably uh, um, most known, which is using uh, search data uh, uh, in behavioral finance research. So um, first, just to sort of um, set terms and get us all sort of on the same page um, by what behavioral finance uh, is, is, is all about. I remember I was, a, I was a PhD student at Northwestern University, boy, a, a long time ago. And, and um, well, it was 2003. Gosh, that is a long time ago, 17 years ago. And uh, I remember um, sort of walking the halls and being exposed to the, to people, the people that were there there was very much a feeling of kind of two sides on, on, a, on a critical issue in the same way uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, kind, kind of disagree about, about court issues. But it was, it was a, sort of a nerdy academic disagreement. And it was about this, this issue about whether markets are efficient or not. And uh, I, I know some of you have taken my behavioral finance class uh, before, so you know these, these definitions. But for those who, who haven't, uh, let me just walk, walk you through it and why I think it matters. So um, it, we call a, a market is efficient um, if prices in that market equal fundamental value. So suppose we were all in a room together and um, uh, which is not COVID appropriate now, but suppose, suppose we were and I pulled out a $10 bill and we started trading that $10 bill around the room uh, in an efficient market, that $10 bill would only trade for $10. You know, I'd give it to Paul and he'd give me 10 ones and, and Paul uh, would give it to Jen who would give uh, him two fives. It'd trade for 40 quarters, 10 ones, two fives, five twos. It would be bought and sold for, for $10, right? That's how to think about an efficient market. Price equals uh, fundamental value because the fundamental value of a $10 bill is $10. Um, believers in this sort of paradigm for uh, the relationship between price and fundamental value are called rationalists because generally they think people behave rationally. It would be crazy for Paul to sell his $10 bill for, for $8, right? That is irrational of Paul. And so, uh, and so that, that's, that's typically what we mean by an efficient market. Price is equal fundamental value. Uh, in, in inefficient market is one in which prices can deviate from their fundamental value. So you, you know, um, Aaron will sell his $10 bill for, for $8, or uh, someone will uh, buy a $10 bill for $12, right? Where, where price, transaction price, can be different than, uh, than fundamental value, um, which might sound odd for sure. Um, believers in this paradigm that prices can deviate from fundamental values are called behavioralists because they, they believe uh, investors have what are called behavioral biases. So these biases that are prescribed from a very big uh, and been around for a long time psychology literature uh, that, that uh, people can make these uh, predictable mistakes. Um, and I think it's a big deal and it was a big deal back at Northwestern and why there's sort of tension on, on, on both sides because it actually has a lot of implications. So if you just think immediately, well, why does it matter? You know, who cares whether prices are different than fundamental value? Think about it, what it means for, for uh, an, an investor, just an average investor, right? If, if, price, if markets are efficient, then an average investor, if they just close their eyes and pick a random stock, they pick Roku or Tesla or Apple or whatever, Beyond Meat, whatever, whatever they pick, uh, if prices always equal fundamental value, then that investor can't make a mistake buying it, right? They're always gonna pay $15 for something that's worth 15 or $27 for something that's worth 27, right? Um, so if, if we think markets are efficient, there's a lot less scope for investor mistakes, right? Um, and so, you know, maybe, you know, you know, you know, maybe in designing retirement plans, we should be fine sort of, uh, sort of letting investors choose their own portfolios and put them in, uh, in, um, in IRA accounts and, and so on and so forth, right? Um, of course, in an inefficient market, investors can make big mistakes, right? They can pay $10 for a $2 bill, right? And that, that would be a big mistake, which could hurt investors. Uh, it has implications for capital allocation, right? I mean, so important. 
right? If you think Tesla, you know, is way overpriced and suppose, suppose Tesla, I, I don't know what Tesla's trading at today. Let's just say it's around $500 uh, today. Um, if you think that price uh, uh, is, is correct, well, then when Tesla, let's say, issues more shares, when, when, when Elon wants to raise a lot more money and he starts selling more shares for $500 each, then th there's no problem. The, the market is going to allocate a bunch of new capital uh, uh, to Tesla and, and they're going to use it for you know, whatever uh, new Tesla project uh, there is. They're, they're going to apply it to their, to their technology. But if you think uh, you know Tesla is worth far less than that, imagine in the extreme it's you know a company that that has a worthless technology issuing shares, issuing new shares. Well, then a lot of capital is going to be allocated to the to, to a technology which is worthless. You know, if if we think about sort of uh, how we want capital to be allocated in an economy, we don't want a bunch of new money to flow to technology which is worthless, right? We want money flowing to to, to technologies uh, uh, which can be put to the best use, right? And so um, uh, in inefficient markets, you can have capital being allocated uh, uh, in the wrong places. Uh, so it definitely has implications for capital allocation. It has implications for, for planning, right? So when markets are efficient, we get a lot of useful information from them, right? Bond prices tell us about uh, uh, inflation, Equity prices tell us about future economic growth if prices are correct. If prices are not correct, then you know, uh, we get a lot less information um, uh, from, from them. So anyway, just quick bullet points. I would spend more time uh, on it in, in my class. Again, for those of you who have attended my class, you, you've seen me talk about these things. It, th this, this debate really matters. It has really important downstream implications for investors, for capital allocation, from what we can learn from prices. Uh, it's a, it's an important issue, uh, whether um, markets are efficient or, or not. Now, just to just to sort of put faces to these names, uh, it, it, in terms of who you should think about, who should pop in your mind when you think about the the rationalist camp. Probably the most famous rationalist is is Gene Fama from the University of Chicago. Um, maybe the most famous behavioralist. Uh, is Bob Schiller from uh, uh, from Yale, or maybe it's a tie. Sort of the co-general of the behavioralist camp is probably uh, another person named Dick Thaler. What's ironic about that is, uh, you know, if if Gene is the captain or the general of the rationalist camp, and Bob is the general of the behavioralist camp, they jointly won the Nobel Prize in 2013. Even though they're so sort of uh, in polar opposites on this issue of market efficiency. Uh, later, of course. Uh, just a few years ago, three years ago, um, uh, Thaler won the Nobel Prize in economics um, is, uh, as well. But those are sort of the pictures, the faces you should put to these, uh, to these uh, sort of names. So, okay, going back to Northwestern. So I was a PhD student at Northwestern. You know, there were definitely two sides, right? Two sides of the fence. Uh, and I, 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 you know, at some point you have to pick a side, right? You can't just remain in neutral. Uh, and, and so I, I remember when I eventually picked my side, I, I was a PhD student, it was super cold. I grew up here in San Diego. So super cold in Evanston, Illinois. I was indoors a lot. And I was watching this show called Mad Money, um, which if you've seen before is, is, uh, is hosted by a very boisterous individual named Jim Cramer who makes, um, uh, who makes stock picks. And I remember thinking, you know, I wonder what happens when he gets really excited, and he usually is excited, uh, and makes a, a stock recommendation. And so I started collecting data on the picks he made and the ex post response from, from the market. And, and, I, I, and this picture is what emerged. This picture is actually for the, the set of stocks which are, that, that he recommends, which are smaller cap stocks. So think about stocks that a, a retail investor could really move with his, his or her trade. Um, and, and I noticed that when he'd make a recommendation, the, the stock would pop kind of in the retail trader language, and then it would start to decline uh, over the next, you know, on average, 50 days, 50 to 100 days, something like that. Um, well, if you just think about it for a little bit, this, this picture doesn't make a lot of sense from the rationalist paradigm, uh, given what we've said already, right? Uh, a, someone who's rational would want would not want to buy this stock uh, on day zero, right? When 
uh, when we know in the next 50 days, it's going to decline on the order of 6% or so. You would not want to be a buyer there. Um, more generally, the, the rationalists would find, a, you know, find it mm, yeah, unusual that you should be able to predict returns like that. I shouldn't be able to predict that the return is going to decline 6% over, over, the, over the next uh, 50 days or so. And, and I shouldn't be able to come up with a, a trading strategy here. I, I should be shorting his recommendations after, uh, after he makes them. Um, uh, and so, uh, and so this, this was kind of the, the moment where I thought, you know what, I, I, you know, I'm seeing this in the data. Um, I think I understand why it's happening. People are getting too excited uh, about these stocks. They're pushing up those prices. There's not enough what we would call arbitrage on the other side that to push back and, 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 uh, and, and sell in the opposite uh, direction. Um, and we can talk about that later if you want to talk about why that might be. And, um, and we get this, this, this pattern in the data. So that, that was kind of like the event for me. That's when I said, all right, I, I think I know I'm, I'm a behavioralist going forward. And, and this, is, this is quite interesting to me. This is the kind of research uh, I, I want to do. Um, so, so just more terms for you. Uh, behavioralists talk a lot about uh, anomalies. Uh, so that last picture was an anomaly. And an anomaly is an instance in which it looks like prices deviate from their fundamental value. So again, remember, behavioralists believe there are times in which price doesn't equal fundamental value. An anomaly is an instance in which, uh, in which that happens. Um, behavioralists point to anomalies as evidence against efficient, uh, efficient markets. Uh, here's, here's one which you know, I, 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 I enjoyed seeing. Um, I don't know if you've all have known, all sort of followed uh, Walmart's behavior over the last uh, four or five years, but they have really tried to compete in the uh, in the online universe with with Amazon. I, you saw the introduction of Walmart Plus recently, um, but four years ago, uh, what sort of make them what made the market take notice of, of Walmart's uh, activity in this space was their acquisition of a company called Jet.com, which was a albeit incredibly small, but competitor of Amazon.com. Um, and this was announced on uh, August 3rd, uh, 2016, Wednesday, August 3rd, 2016. On, on that Wednesday, the stock of Jetcom began to rise from about 12 cents a share, uh, and it peaked uh, at a price of 90 cents a share. So it was about 650% on that, uh, on that news. Here's the, 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 the chart. Uh, in front of you for, for, for Jetcom. The problem is, and maybe you all are seeing where this is going, uh, Jetcom uh, is not Jet.com. Jetcom is actually a defunct Canadian mining company that literally has nothing to do with Jet.com other than the fact that it just sounds a lot like Jet.com. Um, in fact, Jet.com was privately held. We saw Walmart acquired a privately held company. So it's not even clear why investors might think that it could be traded in, in public markets. Clearly, uh, investors just made a mistake, right? They bought something, they thought they were buying jet.com, they were really buying a Canadian mining firm um, in, instead. And that's what pushed up the price and that's why it fell back down because it, it, it wasn't jet.com. So anyway, th those are examples of, of anomalies, right? Instances in which we think uh, prices are not equal to their, uh, to their fundamental value. More broadly, uh, behavioral people, rather than sort of pointing out small instances in which price doesn't equal fundamental value, more broadly, we, we talk about anomaly characteristics. So over the last 40 years, uh, academics have discovered a lot of anomaly characteristics. So these, these are stock characteristics that seem to be able to predict uh, future returns um, in, in a way the, the, the rationalists would be surprised by. Uh, so Examples of these characteristics are things like share issuance, momentum, value, asset growth, short interest, profitability. Again, for those of you who've seen my class, we, we've talked a, a lot about these. Um, and, and for those who are interested uh, in a paper in the Journal of Finance uh, two years ago, um, myself and a couple of co-authors talked about a hundred of these uh, anomaly characteristics. And by the way, for those who are interested in my research in general, Feel free to read any paper you want. Uh, they're all linked on my webpage. I think they're all relatively accessible. None of them are, are too kind of complex mathematically or econometrically. Uh, so if you're interested in any of this, please go to my website uh, under the, the research tab and, and have a look at any paper you're interested in. 
uh, but this paper is, uh, is among them. Uh, so this is kind of like what I think of as behavioral finance part one. This is kind of how I think the behaviorals got their foot in the door. They started providing evidence that sometimes price doesn't equal fundamental value. And, but behavioral finance kind of part two is, all right, you're telling me that there are times in which price deviates from fundamental value. Give me a theory for, for how prices should behave then, right? So, you know, the rationalists have this really elegant theory about why there shouldn't be an, a, a $8, $10 bill. Because if there was an $8, $10 bill, a bunch of people would, would just bid so aggressively for that $8, $10 bill and push its price up to $10, right? I mean, that theory is, you know, uh, comes from a history in economics of, of competitive markets, and it makes a lot of sense, and it's a very attractive theory. And so if behavioralists, you're telling me uh, that, that that isn't, uh, uh, we're seeing instances in which prices don't equal fundamental value, you provide some alternative theories. And, and so, uh, uh, and those theories need to, need to you know, make unique predictions uh, uh, for, for the data. And so what behavioralists have done is, is, is we've come up with, with theories that typically rely on psychology and, and kind of concepts of the mind in general. Um, the issue with that and, and where we're going in terms of uh, talking about search data is con these concepts in behavioral finance, things like investor attention, things like investor sentiment, they have to, they have a lot to do with what's going on in people's minds. And so they're very hard to measure, right? And so some, I, I think probably the most successful part of my research to date has been um, trying to solve this measurement problem with search data. So like if, if, if the attention theorists uh, wanna know, for example, how many people paid attention to Apple today? Well, maybe an answer to that would be how many people searched AAPL in a search engine today, right? So search behavior can be an answer to the question about, you know, uh, how much attention is being paid toward a, a given stock, for example. Or what was investor sentiment like today? You know. Um, typically the way we've extracted investor sentiment, uh, the cleanest way is, is by trying to survey people, survey investors, things like that. But maybe you can get a, a, get a gauge of investor sentiment by their behavior in a search engine. So, so it, I have another paper that, that sort of answers that question with, well, what's investor sentiment like today? Well, how many people search for the term recession today or bankruptcy lawyer or credit card debt? These sort of searches which would reveal investor sentiment rather than having to, to survey people to see how they felt. Um, and so sort of the, 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 the big picture part of this research agenda is because these concepts are things embedded in people's heads uh, and they're hard to measure, let's see if they can be revealed uh, through uh, search behavior of, of millions of households. Um, Sorry, can so, I ask you here? Sure, ask anything. Uh, could you go back to the last slide? Sure. So when you said the people, um, so you can reveal the investor sentiment by uh, checking how much people search the recession, but yeah. is it possible that even though people search recession, but people may, may not believe that the recession will, will start recently. So I'm just wondering if there is a direct thing between your searching the recession and the people really believing, believe the recession. Yeah, so like he, here's, a, here's a picture from, uh, sorry, to, sorry to jump to your answer, but here is, uh, here's a correlation between search volume for the term recession and a survey-based measure. This is the University of Michigan's uh, um, survey. Um, where it, it, the University of Michigan measure of consumer sentiment is a well-known measure. It's been around for a really long time. This is a picture from our paper, but essentially the search volume for, for this term recession has cor a correlation with the survey-based measure. It's about 0.8. So it's really highly correlated with, uh, with a survey-based measure. And again, we didn't have to survey anyone, right? We're just using their search behavior. So I, the answer to your question is yes. And uh, that's a, a part of the, uh, of, um, a part of our paper, uh, which, which sort of advocates for using search behavior to measure investor sentiment. It doesn't use just one term. I'm just showing you what it looks like for recession. Um, uh, in, in our paper, we use, uh, we, we build this index, which we call a, which we call a fears index, which uses lots of key terms like this, like, like recession. Um, but yeah, the, the answer to your question is yes. In, in that paper, we show it has 
external validity in the sense that it's correlated uh, with other measures of investor sentiment. Yeah, good question. I had one question as well. I know you mentioned mad money and I was curious what your thought from a behavioral finance perspective is on companies that are coming out with vaccines or have news that they're gonna have a vaccine and how that's in, in, impacting biotech stocks or just stocks of companies that say they have a vaccine coming out. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on right now with, with COVID and everything. Yeah, I mean, I, my, just to your, to your point, my observation from uh, let's say, let's call it May of this year through, through present day is, is these vaccine announcements or, or just, let's not call them vaccine announcements. Let's just call them just positive, you know, potential vaccine announcements, right? Uh, you, know, you know, there are now dozens and dozens of companies in the vaccine race. Um, and even one company, you know, number, you know, who's number like 34 in the race uh, it announces some slightly positive news. You're absolutely right. It seems like the market responds, uh, it, you know, the market response is is very strong, and it looks like the the ex post response is is reversal. So I you know I've seen a lot of overreaction um, to vaccine related news. To your question, um, you know, and again, maybe it's it's people just sort of forgetting, you know, that a company is number thirty four or forty two in this long line of companies um, which are uh, which, which are which are trying to win the vaccine race, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I've seen a lot of spikes and reversals, absolutely following, especially very uh, small stock announcements regarding vaccine. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, which is consistent with a kind of mad money-like effect, right? That where a lot of retail traders get really excited. There's, you know, there are short sale constraints so that short sellers don't have enough power to push back in the opposite direction and prices go up a lot. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah all right, sorry, was there another question? Feel free to jump in. Yeah, I also have another question, sorry. Sure. So, so based on the, um, the, the PowerPoint you showed here uh, about Apple, so how could you know, like, it's not a post effect of uh, a big job of Apple, then a lot of people just like search Apple. Because um, most of the time you, we, will have, we will see the uh, snowball effect, right? If there's a job, big job, and on certain my stock, then of course in the social media we, we can see a lot of uh, app uh, things happen. And uh, how 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 do the how could you do the data mining in terms of that? Right, right, right. I mean, um, you don't quote unquote know uh, that uh, that you know what you're measuring isn't a consequence of let's say Apple having an extreme return day, right? Which is which is I think your your suggestion. The sort of the proof is in the pudding in terms of return predictability. So what our paper does is it uses uh, uh, large changes in in search volume um, and uh, to predict returns. And basically, what we find is that when there's when there's a a, a spike in search volume, um, uh, that predicts high prices today and and low prices in the future. Just like you know a Kramer recommendation gives a lot of attention. Uh, uh, to a stock or vaccine news gives a lot of attention to a stock. These shocks to attention where, where, where firms uh, have, uh, have big attention shocks as measured by, search, uh, by Google search volume uh, seem to have this spike and, and reversal pattern in the data. So, so I, you know, I can't tell you, you know, why the spike happened today. It could, have been, it could have been an extreme return for Apple. It could have been an Apple product announcement. It could have been an, an analyst report. It could, it could have, it's hard to say. Um, but what it seems to be useful for, and by the way, there, there are people who've shown this in uh, uh, China has a corresponding um, technology called, uh, uh, I believe it's called the Baidu Index. So in, in Google, it's called Search Trends. Um, Baidu's is called the Baidu Index. Uh, you see uh, the spike reversal patterns with, with measured uh, attention shocks uh, coming uh, and again, measured from from search volume. So yeah, I, I, we don't we don't comment on the source of the attention shock, um, but it has the spike and reversal pattern, which is a, a prediction of an attention theory by Barber and, and Odin, um, which is which is basically the idea that when when uh, when a large group of people is 
uh, is shocked with attention. So, you know, suppose I show, I hold up a sign that says Apple. I may, I make a large group of people think about Apple. Um, retail traders, as a fun fact, rarely short. So a lot of people are thinking about Apple. There's some, some people might have positive feelings about Apple. Some people have negative feelings about Apple. But the people that have negative feelings about Apple, the only, the only way they can act on them if they don't short is if they already hold Apple, right? And they want to sell it, right? That's the only way they can act on it. And so, uh, and so when the prediction of this Barbara and Odin theory is when there are these attention shocks, there will be net buying, right? Because you don't have to you know, already own Apple in order to take an action, right? You can just buy it, right? Uh, whereas, again, if retail traders don't, don't short, then you have to have already owned it in order to take an action and, and sell it, uh, again, uh, if there's no, no short selling from retail traders. Um, and so the prediction of this theory is you'll get a lot of net buying, but the, the buying is just for the attention reason. It's not for fundamental reasons. And when prices rise for non-fundamental reasons, they eventually come back down. And so that, that's the, the spike reversal pattern. Um, that you see like with the, the, uh, the mad money example um, and what we see in, in, uh, in, in our study. Um, all right, great questions, I uh, appreciate them. Um, just to give you some, I, I, to, to sort of underscore the fact that the usefulness of, sur of search data isn't just in finance. Uh, in fact, it was being used in a lot of other domains uh, before finance, but I, I thought these were some, some some useful recent examples. So here's a, a paper in a medical journal that uses search volume for COVID symptoms uh, to predict COVID cases uh, by region um, with a lag ranging from like, uh, I think it's on the next slide, but from um, you know up to like 30 days or so, 35 days. So searches for terms like uh, sore throat or, or sneezing or shortness of breath or cough uh, search spikes in, in those terms seem to predict COVID cases in those in those regions ahead of time. Um, and, and again, I, hopefully the connection is quite logical to you. Um, here, here's another. I thought this was super interesting. You know, recently there's this there's been the discussion after the outcome of the U.S. election about how sort of off the polls were, right? Uh, so um, you know, a, a lot of people expected this race to be a landslide for, for Biden. And, and it looked like, uh, and it looks like uh, Biden didn't win in a landslide. He, he, he won, but, but you know, in, in three or four states, it was, uh, it was by a very thin margin, right? And so there has been discussion about, uh, about polls and the problem with polls in general. This was a, a tweet by a pollster uh, the, the night before the election. Um, uh, and what the tweet is showing is a, a, a lot of these places that, that, that essentially using polls thought it was almost certain Biden would win and win by a lot, right? So here's, you know, there's that 90% chance of winning, 96% chance is a model by two Columbia economists, um, uh, 90%, 86%, 80%. There was one outfit though that gave Biden a 65% chance of winning, which was remarkably lower than the rest. It was actually almost identical to the um, uh, to the betting odds. So betting markets, uh, there, there, was a, there was a large liquid betting market on the outcome of the election, also had it about 65% Biden, 35% Trump. What's interesting about this, about plural vote relative to these other one, two, three, four, five, is this uses a combination of polls and search data. Uh, again, with the idea uh, that you know, if we were worried about things like a shy Trump voter, for, for example, uh, he or she might reveal his behavior in his searches, right? He might not talk to a pollster, but he's more likely to reveal behavior in searches. Um, and so actually, you know, the, 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 um, the pollster aggregator that probably did the best job of forecasting uh, the outcome uh, was, was one that in, was one that used search data. Um, so anyway, there's just a couple of examples of how useful I think search data can be, again, at getting in the minds of a broad uh, population. Um, all right, but let, let me talk to you about uh, about the the two papers that that I've used that that um, that take advantage of search data. I've, I've talked a little bit about it already. The the first is a is a paper published in the journal Finance in in 2011. Uh, as I mentioned, we use search volume for stock tickers like MSFT or AAPL as a way to measure retail attention towards stocks. And we show that that signal predicts returns. Um, 
uh, for uh, for small stocks in general, but especially for really small stocks, which uh, embodied by IPOs. Um, I'll show you that uh, that picture in a moment. But just to give you some sense that search volume does a good job of capturing what we think, here is, for example, uh, Google search. Uh, so Google's product is called uh, uh, Google Trends. Here is search volume for diet. Um, and what, what you see in this picture for diet is throughout the year, fewer and fewer people think about dieting. During the holiday season right here, here's Thanksgiving and here's Christmas, very few people think about dieting. But at the beginning of every year, everyone thinks about dieting, right? Do you see these peaks right here? Peak, 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 peak. And then see these troughs, these Thanksgiving uh, and Christmas troughs here. And again, it, it, it matches my intuition about when people think about dieting. Um, nobody thinks about dieting during Thanksgiving and Christmas. But at the beginning of the year, usually as part of a New Year's resolution, people think about dieting again. And so, so search volume, again, just in this simple picture, captures what you know, millions of people around the U.S. are thinking in a nice, predictable uh, 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 time series pattern, which, again, conforms with, with my intuition about when people think about dieting. Um, so we collect data in, in the journal finance paper for Russell 3000 companies from Google Trends between 2004 and 2008. Um, we use uh, tickers rather than firm names. Uh, obviously, you know, if you type in Apple, for example, you could be interested in Apple product or Best Buy. You can be interested in a Best Buy product. But if you type in AAPL or BBY, that, that reveals interest in uh, in those equities, right? And that's what we're trying to measure, right? Attention towards Apple stock and Best Buy stock. Okay? Um, uh, when we look, when we uh, do our analysis for IPOs, we we use company names often because uh, the, the ticker isn't available well before the IPO. Uh, back when Google Trends was just a um, was just a, a a beta product, a lab product for Google. Uh, I took this screenshot, but you, you can see what we're after here. So like here, here's search volume for MSFT, here's Microsoft and here's Apple through time. So you get you know, a lot of variation uh, for, for Apple and, and, and Microsoft. Um, what's interesting is in the literature at the time, existing attention measures uh, are, were things like uh, trading volume, media coverage. If you use media coverage and trading volume during this time, you would, you would think Microsoft got more attention uh, than Apple. It, it had more trading volume and more media coverage. But, but when you look at actually search volume, it looks like people paid a lot more attention to Apple than, than Microsoft. So it was very different at the time we wrote this paper than existing measures of investor intention. Um, let me just give a, a brief summary of what we do in the paper. Um, um, Part one, we show that our attention measure is correlated but not fully captured by these other attention measures I just mentioned. Um, we show also that our attention measure is capturing retail attention. So we, we look at retail brokerages and find strong correlation with volume traded over those brokerages. Um, and then given that we're dealing with retail attention, we consider that Barber and Odin theory that I, that I talked to you about uh, before. Uh, that shocks to retail attention create price pressure, which pushes prices up temporarily, and then uh, they fall back down. And so we find retail attention predicts short-term uh, increases in small stocks uh, and in IPOs. I don't have time to go through all the details, but again, if you want to take a look at the paper, it's on, it's on my website. Um, the, the second application is one that I mentioned earlier. It, the paper is called The Sum of All Fears where we build a, uh, an index of fear revealing terms um, like, uh, like recession um, and show that that index um, um, predicts uh, returns, volatility and fun, and fund flows in a way prescribed by theories of investor sentiment. So for example, when people are very fearful that predicts flows away from equity funds and, and into fixed income funds, for example. Um, I already showed you the, the correlation between uh, searches for recession and well-known um, survey measures like the University of, uh, of Michigan measure of consumer sentiment. So it, it looks like search volume is a kind of quick and easy way to sort of gauge uh, the, the sentiment of a broad population without surveying them, right? Uh, so uh, could potentially be quite useful for measuring uh, investor sentiment again, without asking people. Um, uh, 
Um, so again, I, I'm, I'm about out of time, it looks like. So, and I wanna leave time for any additional questions. In general, uh, I, I think search data is a real promising way to look into the minds of a broad population and investor minds are, are what behavioral finance is all about. Again, it's been the, the subject of two of my papers. Again, probably what I'm best uh, uh, well known for. Um, uh, I, I'll also just tell you about some other current research that, that I've been interested in. Again, you can find it on my webpage if you're interested in it. Lately, I've been getting into data um, uh, on StockTwit. So for those of you not familiar, StockTwit is a big social network of traders. Um, and uh, and I, I have a, a paper which is forthcoming that looks at the effects of partisan beliefs as measured on StockTwit. So, so you can use the language uh, of StockTwit's uh, trader. So, you know, if, if people use terms uh, like crooked Hillary, for example, that reveals likely the person who, who, who uses that term is, is a Republican, right? Someone uses uh, um, a term like liar in chief that usually reveals that person is anti-Trump, that person is likely uh, a Democrat. So we use language to identify the political beliefs of, of people on stock twits, And then we see how these Republicans and Democrats uh, feel about equities through the COVID-19 crisis. And sort of the big takeaway from our papers is uh, Republicans were a lot less uh, worried uh, about uh, about equities during uh, during COVID-19 than, uh, than the rest of the population uh, was. Uh, so that's one paper, again, on my website, you can take a look. We also look at uh, what I think is a really important um, component of disagreement in markets, uh, which is this tendency of investors to get in what are called echo chambers. So the idea is if I'm a Tesla bear, for example, I, you know, I really, think Tesla's way overpriced, people think way too highly of Musk, uh, I will tend to consume a lot of information which is very negative about Tesla. I won't expose myself to information that's kind of on the other side, right, which is positive about Tesla. Again, think about this kind of echo chamber behavior in the political sphere where a Republican, for example, will watch a lot of Fox News and a Democrat will watch a lot of MSNBC, right? And what that does is that sort of reinforces the original point of view and, and when you have, you know, Tesla bears looking at a lot of negative information and Tesla bulls uh, looking at a lot of positive information, that's going to cause a lot of disagreement and a lot of trading. And so uh, the echo chamber behavior documents uh, this phenomenon on stock puts and then links it to, to trading volume where we think uh, uh, that, that's sort of the, the, the outcome that, uh, that we think disagreement is, is most uh, uh, important for. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I've talked a lot about my research. Um, and like I said, I, I, I think I went over time a little bit, but I wanted to leave time if, if there are questions about any of that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll open the floor if there, if there are any questions. All right, Joey, I, I had a quick question. So you're talking a lot about the politics. So based on the search data, so how do we conclude uh, whether it's a positive or negative sentiment? Sorry can, sorry, can you you start over? Sorry, man, you start over because I think two people were talking at the same time. Can you start over with your question? Uh, like based on the specific data, so how do we conclude whether it's a positive or negative sentiment on the market? Right. So, so in, in in the paper, the way we conclude whether it's positive or negative sentiment is by looking at the aggregate searches uh, of a lot of different key terms. So we would say there's a lot of negative sentiment when people are searching for recession and gold prices and bankruptcy and so on and so forth. when there's a lot of search for a lot of negative terms at the same time our our sentiment index would be very low people people have very low or or you know pessimistic investor sentiment when there's not a lot of search for those terms then we would say it's it's higher so so that that's in our in the paper that's how we measure um sentiment is whether people are searching for these really um uh, kind of fear revealing terms uh, a lot. Um, and sorry, there was someone else talking. Uh, go yeah, ahead. absolutely. I, I had a two part question. So everything you're saying is literally relating me to social media companies. So I'm trying to see what, if you, if you can find this information as a behavioral finance professor, what role do these social media companies have in, I guess, affecting the economy or how people they invest? And the second part of it was, have you seen with the Republican versus Democrat a difference in the way they invest their money or they believe in the economy or any opinions like that? Yeah, so to your second question, so on StockTwits, I can see 
uh, Republicans and, and non-Republicans or Democrats, I can see how they think about stocks. So on stock twits, you can do a posting and then you can label. So suppose I post about Beyond Meat and then I can label my post as bullish or bearish about Beyond Meat. Does that make sense? So I can see how people feel about equities. I, I really can't, I don't know, you know, uh, you know, Goldman 156 is holdings, right? I mean, it's just a, it's just a username. He has a, a belief about Beyond Meat but I don't know what, what exactly he's holding. So it's harder to know uh, much about, uh, about holdings. I can get a little bit there by trying to decode some of his uh, posts and, and, and figure out whether he's making statements uh, about trading or, or not. But in general, I don't get to observe holdings, um, which, which is a drawback. I would love to know, I would love to know holdings. Your first question about, about social media companies, um, I mean, uh, in, in terms of our echo chamber paper, uh, one thing I can say is certainly having a, a, a platform like um, uh, like StockTwits allows people to get in echo chambers, right? I mean, 50, 60 years ago, there was only like a handful of sources where you could get information about markets, right? Maybe it's the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, right? They're not not a ton of sources where you could where you could read about stocks and investments and so on. But with, with, social, with, with the social media platforms, if I'm a Tesla bear, there are thousands of other Tesla bears that I can just listen to. And I, and they, I, can, I can sign up to follow them. You all know how Twitter, or in this case, Socklist works. Those, if I sign up to follow them, their tweets become my newsfeed, right? That's what I consume. It's just lots and lots of bearish behavior. And so in terms of that second paper I talked to you about, you know, the, the presence of these social media platforms allows for a lot more echo chamber behavior, right? I mean, again, think 50, 60 years ago, you know, it'd be much harder to live in an echo chamber. Uh, whereas now it's very easy to, to just sign up to listen to bullish behavior about Tesla or sign up just to listen to, to, uh, to bearish information about Tesla. So um, in terms but of- I, in terms guess, of I guess the question was a little bit different. So when I was thinking of like, say Facebook, if they have all this data on people, they could somehow play the heartstrings and the emotions of people to make them more behavioral finance related. I mean, like if it is an ad or something like that, I feel like that this could just increase the behavioral finance, I guess the, uh, the air, the weird things that you see, right. That you, if you're a traditionalist, you wouldn't see, I feel like that's going to increase with these, these social media companies. I think that we're going to see a lot of erratic so behavior. If, if your question is in principle, could social media companies use their power and knowledge about behavioral finance um, to uh, affect markets, of course. Like you know, for example, we know attention shocks push up prices. If you know, if it's obviously um, social media companies can put things in front of our faces uh, um, a lot, right? So they could they could create attention shocks for for firms, and that could definitely drive up prices. So you're absolutely right that uh, that social media companies sort of uh, armed with a lot of the findings in behavioral finance could affect markets. There's a, 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 it's absolutely true, but could is different than are. Uh, you know, I, I, I haven't looked at and I don't have any evidence that they are. Uh, I, I had one more question for you. Sure. I just want to know what's the most compelling traditionalist argument? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, it's, it's the, the no free lunch argument, right? That the reason why there isn't an $8, $10 bill is because all of us, all 29 people on the Zoom call right now would be buying the heck out of it, you know, and Jeremy would bid $8.50, I would bid $8.75, uh, Paul would bid $9, and we just pushed it up to 10 like that. That, that argument is very elegant. Uh, it's very compelling. Um, so that's probably, you know, and, and, and again, I think that works a lot of the time. So uh, behavioralists don't think price always doesn't equal fundamental value. We think there are times in which it deviates and we have sort of a recipe for, for when those times occur. But, uh, but I, I mean, I, I, think, I think the core of the rationalist argument um, is, uh, is, is quite compelling. Um, the ones that are so stingy that they don't allow deviations, uh, um, uh, don't, don't allow instances in which prices don't equal fundamental value, that, that's where the disagreement comes. Thank you. Yeah. Professor, I just had a question on that note, um, on the kind of rationalist perspective and the efficient market hypothesis. They, I mean, it's in every textbook of finance. 
uh, basically advocating that prices are meant to equal fundamental value. But if, if we look at the behavioral list argument, there are of course times when prices do not equal fundamental value based on uh, irrational exuberance and other arguments. So uh, just wanted to hear your thoughts on why they still still teach the EMH in finance classes. Yeah, I, I think I think because the EMH, I think the the EMH is still a very useful default. It's a great default position. Let, let, let's believe this is true by default and then talk about instances and situations in which there's, uh, there's deviation. I, I think the EMH is extremely useful. I, I, just because you find instances in which prices don't equal fundamental value. And you know, sometimes you see interviews with Thaler and Fama where Thaler razzes Fama uh, with these like examples, like the Jetcom Walmart example, he has a Cuba fund example where, uh, you know, where uh, Cuba is the name of a, of a mutual fund has nothing to do with actually the country of Cuba, but you know the mutual fund uh, uh, price, its net asset value goes up a lot when Barack Obama normalized relations with Cuba. Like and, you know, Thaler razzes Fama a lot with examples like this, these kind of cute examples that suggest people are making mistakes, right? Uh, um, but I think the EMH is useful as, as a default, and then we can talk about why there might be deviations from that default. For example, when you shut down short sellers, when you don't allow people with pessimistic views from participating in the markets, I think you can get prices that are too high, right? That's an instance in which prices can deviate from fundamental value. So I think it's useful as thinking from sort of a default perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I also have a question here. So. Um, so my question is about the data, the stock trace data. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you can tell which trader is more like extrapolator and which one, which investor has really strong disposition effects or really loss averse uh, from what they tell, what they talk about in the stock trees. And then and if we can use their uh, behavior, if we can check uh, whether they keep buying stocks during the bubble periods. Yeah, I, I guess you can, I think the answer, Jen, is you could get noisy measures of that. You don't get to actually observe their holding. So you would have to infer their trading behavior by their, their posts. Like if someone posts just added 100 shares of AAPL, if you, you know, you know, if you're, if you have a good enough sort of Python script to, to take that data and say, all right, I know that means this trader just bought a hundred shares of AAPL, but it's, it's, it's going to be messy. Uh, for our echo chambers behavior, we have a, a script that tries to read these posts and identify actual trades. Um, it's moderately successful. So like in a large sample, I think we get it right. Uh, uh, sorry, in a large sample that we took and we read them by hand, um, our script gets it right about 70, 72% of the time, something like that. But it's, it's, it's messy, right? Because human language is messy and, uh, and especially language on stock quits is messy. Um, so I think you could do it. It would just be noisy. Uh, it wouldn't be perfect. Okay. Yeah. Professor, I have one more question regarding sentiment. So, so like you told me that make the sentiment something like recession or something will affect the market. But yeah. those terms are, will affect the entire market. So if you take only for Apple stuff, how do we conclude the negative sentiment terms for Apple stuff? Sorry, can you, can you repeat your question one more time? It was, how do I conclude that negative sentiment what? How do you conclude negative sentiment in terms for a particular stock, like something like Apple? Like what are the negative oh, yeah, terms? Yeah. So uh, the, the sentiment, sorry, great question. The, the, the sentiment paper that I've talked to you about is, is broad market sentiment. Uh, so it's not about individual stocks. So when people search for recession or bankruptcy lawyer or credit card debt, things like that, just like when the University of Michigan asked them how they feel about the economy, um, it's it's a measure of of market level um, sentiment. It's not stock specific. Good question. But can it generate any relation between, relationship between the stock and the overall negative sentiment on the market? Is there is there a relationship between uh, a particular stock or or you're saying like the market portfolio, like the S and P five hundred? A particular stock. Uh, we, we didn't look at particular stock just because our measure was was at the market level. We didn't look at particular stocks in, the, in that paper. We looked at either the market in general or uh, a portfolio of a particular kind of stocks like, you know, super volatile high beta stocks versus low volatility stocks. But we didn't look at individual stocks. Thank you. 
Yeah, no problem. Joey, do you think there's going to be any after the fact value in, in trying to go back and take uh, like that Robin Hood data that is no longer available and trying to trying to correlate that with with the social media information you've already scraped? Yeah, I mean, I would I, uh, probably uh, and I would guess uh, I would guess they're going to be highly correlated. I would guess. Um, so Paul is talking about there's a there's a, a data set um, at I believe the website is robintrack.com, which is a, a data set of um, uh, within day holdings, uh, a number of Robinhood accounts which hold uh, individual stocks. Uh, and I, I think to Paul's point, I think you would find strong correlation between. Uh, changes in in holdings and stock to its activity for sure. I think I, I think you would. Um, so I, I'm sure I'm sure there will be people that that uh, that explore that. Um, it is too bad that it that it no longer updates. I actually thought that was a really cool uh, a really cool data source. But uh, I'm sure I'm sure measures on stock to its ac activity measures on stock to its and and the Robinhood data uh, are definitely correlated. Um, yeah. And I I've got a oh, I a quick question. I want to say, Professor Engelberg, what's your take on the um, the hottest? So everyone here is still in school. We're trying to get jobs. What do you think some great jobs are right now in this economy? Like, like um, I'm just thinking because we're all interested in finance and what jobs we can get. Like, what what would you think is a is like a interesting job right now in the market with all that's going on? All right. I mean. I um, it's, 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 it's a good question. E even though, uh, quant in general is getting hit pretty hard uh, over, over the last uh, few months, uh, I see more and more financial positions that, um, that have, um, some combination of, of programming database management, uh, abilities as, as a really important pre prerequisite. So, so the more you're able to be super facile with, uh, with data, especially financial data, I, I think that helps in financial jobs a, a lot now, uniquely so. Uh, sort of, I think gone are the days of, uh, not gone totally, but you know, in terms of the, the value of sort of the typical investment banker uh, characteristic, you know, being sort of a, a good handshaker and salesman, I think that's becoming less important. And being, like I said, in incredibly facile, intuitive, um, skillful with uh, with data and programming is becoming more important. I, that if I if I were in your shoes, I would try and build that component of my CV um, the most. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, thank you all for. Uh, um, for a great time, great questions, and, uh, uh, and um, I look forward to seeing, for those of you who haven't been in my behavioral finance class before, I recognize a lot of you that have, but for those of you who haven't, I look forward uh, to seeing you uh, in class later, later this year. Uh, hope, hopefully, we can be in person. Hopefully, this recent vaccine news turns into uh, great vaccine news, and, uh, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be in person uh, soon, but I look forward uh, to seeing you all uh, in the spring. Thank you, Professor. Thank Thanks you all. Thank you.